Well, this morning we're continuing in our series, The Power of Story. It's our, it's our final week. If you've enjoyed this June, listening to the, the power of story and hearing your own stories, well, today's the last week. And, and if this hasn't been the series you've been super excited about, today's the last week. Next week, something different's happening. So that's good, I guess. The power of story is so meaningful because the reality is that, that we can tell our own stories or we can tell God's story in and through our life. And if we're going to tell God's story, then our stories become stories about what God has done, what God is doing, and what God will do. Our stories are part of what God is doing and will do. It's not something that ended. It's not just what's written in the Bible, but God continues to work in and through each and every one of us. But if we're stop and we're still, we recognize that our stories, our lives, they all have those moments. You know those moments I'm talking about, right? Those moments that seems like from this point forward, nothing can be the same. You know, maybe it's we graduate high school and from that moment, I'm no longer a high schooler and I've got to figure out what adult looks like. Maybe it's, it's an illness and you're in the hospital. Well, for me this week, I, I've had both the trouble and the privilege to experience some of those moments. I spent some time at a funeral with people that were close to me this week. Death is one of those moments because nothing's the same. Thursday, I, I got to spend some, some time with this couple that's from Cornerstone and, and they're getting married. And so is the rehearsal this afternoon, they get married and, and for them, after today, nothing's the same. And when we have those moments, when we're the authors, when we write the story, when we're the main character, those moments are hard stop periods. End of story, start new story. But, but what I want you to see is that when we're in God's story, when we're, we're in the narrative that God's been writing in and through our lives from Genesis all the way to now, those things that we think are periods are really commas. They're really just pauses. Let me, let me explain what I mean, and if you're like one of those grammatical people, uh, I, I mean metaphorically, this isn't like grammatic, so don't email me and tell me I use them wrong. What I mean is when we write the stories, these moments happen, period, means stop. End of this thought, beginning of new. These are separate. But when we're in God's story, that's not how it works. It, it, it's this happens, comma, pause, and now the rest of the story. Now it continues on. There isn't this hard stop period because the whole thing is God's story and we're interwoven into it. And so I think so often in our stories, we get so caught up in ourselves that when we come to those moments, the periods, the hard stops, we think everything's over. Everything stops. And we must have started new. But if we really take a half a step back, and just see God's narrative and all of this, how, how we are getting to be part of God's story. This period is really just a comma. And when we're going to get into this in a second, but I want you to hear that after the comma is when the miracle happens. Let me tell you what I mean. Our Jesus, our Jesus is a Jesus of commas and not periods. Our Jesus is a, is a Jesus that continues the story on every single time. How many of you guys ever heard of the story of Lazarus or the store? Either one, you can raise your hand. Lazarus, Jesus' friend. Mary and Martha's brother. The three of them are, are really close to Jesus. Jesus is really close to them. But this is a time where Jesus is starting to become unpopular with some of the leaders. And so he finds himself a little out of town, a little further away. And he gets word. Lazarus is ill. The disciples, they think, oh, well, this means let's pack up and go. You've been healing people here. Of course, we're going to race to Bethany to heal your friend Lazarus. And Jesus says, just, just hold on. We've got business to do here. We'll go when it's time. And the disciples kind of, they question him and they ask him. And, and finally, Jesus says this. He says, aren't there 12 hours in the day? Whoever walks in the day doesn't stumble because they see the light of the world. 
But whoever walks in night does stumble because the light isn't in them. It doesn't say that they stumble because they can't see. It doesn't say that they stumble because, because the light's not shown around them. The light isn't in them. God's trying to tell the disciples, I've got this. This is a God thing. Just walk with me. There is wisdom about to happen, comma. Two days later, Jesus and his disciples, they make their way to Bethany. And when they get in town, Martha... Lazarus' sister runs and finds Jesus crying. He says, if you were only here, my brother wouldn't be dead. Can you hear the anger in that statement? If you were only here, Jesus, you were out healing everybody else. And my brother, your friend, is dead. If you were only here. Do you hear Martha feels that period? This is the end of the story. There's nothing that can happen. It's over. Jesus, if you were only here. Jesus looks at Martha and says, Martha, your brother will live again. And she goes, I, I know, I know when, when the second coming and I get that. And Jesus says, no, I mean your brother will live again. Go and tell your sister Mary that I'm here. And she goes and, and finds Mary and Mary's at the house grieving with, with everybody else. And she pulls Mary aside and says, Mary, the teacher, our rabbi, Jesus, is here. And he asked to see you. And so Mary goes and, and finds Jesus. And she says the exact same thing Martha says. If you were only here, our brother, your so-called friend, would still be alive. Do you hear the finality of, the, of their statements? It's period. It's over. Jesus, you messed us up. What are we supposed to do now? It's all over. But see, that's not the Jesus that we love and follow, is it? That's not the end of the story. It's not a period. It's a comma. Jesus, he goes on and takes Mary and those who had followed Mary out and he says, show me this tomb. And as he says that, he starts to weep. And the crowd starts to say, this Jesus must have really loved Lazarus, but yet he did nothing. And when he gets to the tomb, Jesus weeps more. And we learn Jesus isn't weeping for the death of Lazarus. Jesus is weeping for the broken heartedness of those who believe this is a broken period, it's overdone, there's nothing we can do. Jesus wept for them. But it's not a period. It's a comma. Jesus replied, didn't I tell you that if you believe, you will see God's glory? So they moved the stone. Jesus looked up and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. I know you always hear me. I say this for the benefit of the crowd standing here so that they will believe that you sent me. Having said this, Jesus shouted with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his feet bound and his hands tied and his face covered with cloth. Jesus said to them, untie him and let him go. And Jesus lives. What felt like a period, what felt like an ending, what felt like we could never come back from. For Jesus was just a comma. See, Jesus had to wait. Because if Jesus came right away when, when Lazarus was sick and, and on the verge of death or even just died, people say, well, he wasn't really dead. In the Jewish culture, the spirit didn't truly leave the body for three days. So Jesus comes on the fourth day. When it feels like the periods happen, it's over. But it's in the comma that the miracle happens, right? If he had come day two, this wouldn't have been a miracle. It just would have been what happened. But what felt like a period, if it was just Lazarus, if it was just Martha, if it was just Mary, if it was just their stories, our brother died. It's over. What do we do now? But in the, the scheme of the narrative of, of God's story, it's a comma. They, people go on to live. The funeral that I was at, 
person we grieved over. It's a comma. We believe that he's in heaven living a joy-filled life with Jesus. Here on earth, it's hard for us to see that. It may feel like a period, but with Jesus, it's a comma because the miracle happens right after the comma. Even Jesus' very own life isn't a story about a period, right? Jesus is, is taken, captured. He's hung on a cross. And it says in Scripture that at noon, from noon until three in the afternoon, the whole earth was dark. At three, Jesus cried out with a loud shout, My God, my God, why have you left me? After hearing him, some standing there said, Look, he's calling Elijah. Some ran and filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on a pole. He offered it to Jesus to drink, saying, Let's see if Elijah will come to take him down. But Jesus let out a loud cry and died. Period. Friday afternoon at 3 p.m., that feels like a period. But we as Christ followers know on Sunday morning, that was merely a pregnant pause. That was a big comma. And that's where the resurrection happens. That's where the miracle happens. It's always right after the comma. And so in our lives, when we feel like we're experiencing the end, the over, the what do we do nows, maybe we need to take a half a step back and see if this is all part of God's story. This is a comma. And the miracle's about to happen. Because we don't get to just let go of what happened before the period and start a new sentence in life. That couple that I'm going to uh, help get married this afternoon, they, they're getting married and they don't get to just leave the baggage or good stuff that they learn from their families when they come together, right? Merely two commas coming together and living on. All of our stories are filled with commas if we put them in the perspective of Jesus. And there's a story I want you to hear uh, from John. John, why don't you come on up? Let's welcome John. <clears throat> now, John McCollum, your story is not this grand uh, story with this apex period moment that everything changes and shifts and God spoke and light shined and heavens opened up. I don't want to set everybody up to, to think that that's about what they're hearing. But you have a story full of commas and periods. Mostly commas. Mostly commas. Well, let's start. So, John, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? All right. Well, my name is John McCollum, more commonly known as Lynn's husband. And uh, we've, uh, we've been married 31 years. 31 years. You got married and, at age four? That's pretty awesome. Yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> she did. <laughs> yeah. No, um... Let's see, well, my story. Well, I was in West Philadelphia. I was born and raised <laughs> on the playgrounds where I spent most of my days, just chilling out, relaxing, max and all, cool and all, you know, shooting some b-ball outside of the school. <laughs> For those of you who don't know what that is, that's, that's really funny. Jesus loves you, but you need to watch more TV. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, uh, I grew up in Fairfield, just down the road there on, uh, on Sims Road. Uh, grew up at St. Mark's United Methodist Church, been a Methodist my entire life. Uh, graduated from Fairfield High School, went to UC, and then went to work for Champion International, the paper company there in Hamilton. Uh, after UC, went to Pensacola. Uh, that's where I met Lynn. And um, we, got, we got married and moved back here in 94. It's a year or so after Cornerstone got started. We were looking for a new church, we were driving around, and one day we saw a little sign hanging on a power pole out on 747, out in front of this house, uh, this property. And so we called the phone number, found out they were meeting at Heritage Elementary, went to the first service, and uh, we've been there ever since. I said, uh, the first day we walked in, first person I saw was Mark Kessler, who went to Fairfield High School also, a couple years ahead of me. And I remember thinking, I don't like that guy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because he reminded me of something I didn't want to 
remember. Uh, Mark's older brother, Steve, and my older brother, Fred, were good friends in high school. They both uh, starred on the basketball team. Uh, they went to the same college in Nashville and played college ball together and were great friends. Uh, Mark played on the Fairfield High School basketball team when he was there, and he was very good. And I was a member of the Fairfield High School basketball team. I didn't play very much. I did, I did average a triple-double, though. Yeah, except it was in seconds of playing time, <laughs> turnovers, and personal fouls. So, But uh, in spite of that, uh, we've been a cornerstone ever since. It's been great. So, John, um, we've been asking the question each week, um, where did God find you? Because we, we recognize that God pursues us our whole life. Um, but where, where did God find you before you decided to turn over and, and look at God? Well, God found me in the church there at St. Mark's. I grew up at St. Mark's, went through Sunday school every week, uh, was there in uh, worship every week. My mom was the third grade Sunday school teacher at St. Mark's. And for any of you that are familiar with the classic Methodist system of Sunday school, third grade is when you learn all this stuff. You do all your memorization, the books of the Bible, the Apostles' Creed, any other creeds, any other teachings, all the stuff you need to memorize happens in third grade. So my mom being the teacher, I knew all this stuff. I can still to this day, if forced, tell you all the books of the Bible from memory, uh, but I don't want to do that right we, we now. We won't make you do it right now. <laughs> we all believe you. <clears throat> um, uh, went through um, the system there at, uh, at St. Mark's, and around fifth or sixth grade, went through confirmation. Confirmation is when you're supposed to take on for yourself responsibility for your faith, uh, that was made in your name at your baptism, if you're baptized as an infant. Um, somehow I missed all that. Uh, glad to say we don't get into that here at Cornerstone. It is more personal. But from my experience, confirmation was just more memorizing stuff. I already knew all the stuff. And so confirmation was just joining the church. You're joining the church. You're becoming a member. It's just kind of what you do. That's the system. That's the way the system works. And uh, I knew all this stuff in the system, and I did what the system said to do. Uh, but I really had not owned my faith up to that point in time. I would probably have to say I was religious, but not a Christian at that point. So, John, I, I don't think that you purposely or, or you would have even at the time said that there was a period, but, but there kind of was. There was, I've got Jesus. I'm, I'm doing all the right things. I go to church. I know the rules. I, I, I know the Bible. Uh, somebody says, Lazarus, and you go, not the store. But, you know, you know all the things. I knew all the stuff. I knew a lot of individual stories here and there. And, Heard a lot of stories in Sunday school. And I don't think you would have ever said that this is a period, but, but I think that the reality was for you, you didn't. You, you had done what, was, what your parents thought. You had done what you had been taught. Um, but, but what we know is that period really wasn't a period. There was a comma in there because there was a moment in which something changed for you and you decided to love God the way God loves you. So what, what happened there? That's correct. I'd say there are probably a couple of, of commas there. The first one, um, when I went to UC... Uh, decided to get involved with campus ministry. I mean, that's the, the right thing to do. I'd always done the right thing to do. And uh, so I got hooked up with this one local campus ministry. Unfortunately, they allowed me to cook the hamburgers at the first gathering we had. And I made an Old Testament burnt offering at that <laughs> point. Um, went back a couple of more times, despite the fact of my great embarrassment. And notice that uh, we didn't do any Bible study. We didn't talk about all the stuff that I knew. If we talked about the stuff, I could have helped out. But we didn't talk about the stuff. They did a lot of protesting at things that were going on. And it's like, you know, I, I guess that's a part of it. But I don't know. It just kind of left me flat. So my sophomore year... Um, so nonetheless, I did, didn't really get involved with the campus ministry, went back to St. Mark's every weekend and kept doing my thing there. Sophomore year, I was living in Calhoun Hall, and there was a guy that was around 
all the time. He lived in Calhoun also. Very strong evangelical Christian. A little bit on the obnoxious side, but I think that's what I needed, mm. to be honest with you. thing I remember about him is he could always get the lights turned on at Nippert Stadium so that we could play ultimate Frisbee even at night down on the turf. I don't know how he did that. I don't want to know how he did that, <laughs> but he got that done. One day, I'm down in the basement of Calhoun Hall in the workout room, getting lifting buff. weights, yep. getting yep. buff, yeah. And um, I didn't have a spotter there because macho men don't need spotters Absolutely. when you're lifting weights. That's for wimps. And uh, I got a hold of too much weight, and I got in a bad spot. Fortunately, that guy was there and helped lift the weight off me that I couldn't handle on my own. I thanked him and we got to talking. He used that opportunity to take a sheet of paper and draw that picture with the two cliffs on it, you know, where you got the cliff over here, where humans on this side and the cliff over here, where God's on that side and sin is in the middle. And we're trying as humans to get over to God, but no matter what we do, our sin separates us from God. And some folks may be able to jump farther than others, but nobody on their own can jump all the way across that chasm. And he drew that cross in the center that spans the gap between humans and God. And that Jesus is the way, is that stands in the gap and allows us humans to have contact with God. And I thanked him for that picture. I'd seen that before. I knew that was really cool. I liked that. I thanked him and... Uh, uh, kind of shoot him off, and uh, away he went. And but that kept going over in my mind. You know, I know all the stuff, but I've never done that for myself. I've never owned that, and so it was there in Calhoun Hall that I got on my knees and um, surrendered my life, asked Jesus to come into my life to be the Savior, the Rescuer of my soul. And the Lord of my life, the, the boss, the one that sets the priorities. Took a while to grow and learn into what exactly that meant. But that was, that was a big point for me. Um, uh, at the time, I remember thinking, it's kind of like knowing about the best pizza place in Clifton, Adriatico's. Uh -huh. And telling people about Adriatico's, handing out their coupons, putting up the flyer on your dorm room door. But you ain't never ate their pizza. Hmm. How ironic was that? That's what I remember thinking at the time. Uh, fast forward a few years after graduation. I'm down in Pensacola. I meet Lynn, which is another huge part of my spiritual growth. Uh, we are uh, a good team between mm -hmm. the two of us, uh, growing in our faith. Uh, and a couple years after we're married, we get in invited to be a part of the very first disciple Bible study yeah. when it comes out in the early 90s. And so we go through that. It's 34 weeks, and we did not want it to end, hmm. even though it was 34 weeks. And it was just like, you know, blew my mind. All of a sudden, all those individual separated stories that I'd heard in Sunday school, it all flowed together. Why does this make sense? Oh, that's where this goes. That's how this happens. That's why, you know, and it all made sense. And it was like, oh my gosh, this is awesome. And I just felt God moving in me to say, you can do this. You can teach that. You need to teach this. You know, it's going to mean more if someone who's not a professional Christian, like a pastor, if someone not like that leads this mm -hmm rather than if the pastor does it. And so I started leading Disciple Bible Study, and it was just awesome. I learned, relearned my passion for research, study, storytelling, speaking, things of that nature. Um, I've heard that public speaking is like the number one fear out there for humans. Public speaking has never been uh, a problem for me public shutting up, that would be a problem that's, that's for more me. Their, that's more their fear? That's their right fear, now. yes. yes. So, uh, okay. But anyway, Disciple Bible Study was huge. And, and then uh, when we moved back up here in 94, um, got invited to go on a weekend retreat, the walk to Emmaus. Mm -hmm. And just once again, after another comma, 
God blows your mind. You know all the stuff. You love sharing all the stuff, knowing more stuff. The more you learn, the more you realize there is to learn. And, but it's taking it all from here and moving it in here uh, is a big part of that weekend. And um, just as an advertisement, there are men's and women's walks to Emmaus coming up here in July. So there's information outside there if you'd like to be involved with that. But it was, it was just awesome. And, and I grew through Emmaus. And once you get involved with working on a couple of Emmaus walks, they let you give the talks. There's like 15 talks on an Emmaus weekend. And I found that I loved giving those talks. They give you the outline and you fill it in with your experience and your take and your story. And it was like, wow, this just really resonated. I got a lot of good feedback and was like, wow, this whole storytelling thing and speaking thing is just awesome. You know, God's really using this and, and working through me in this. And uh, so, yeah, I think that's one of the things that God is continuing to do in me is, is through, uh, you know, speaking and teaching and sharing and learning more and sharing more and shutting up more, so... But so what I hear in that, though, is, is this reality that there are uh, every single one of those combo moments, you could have stepped back and been like, I know God. I got this. I got this. I, I, don't, I, don't, I already seen the, cro the drawing cross. Nothing new to me here. I, I've, I've read the Bible. I know. I don't need to study it. I, I, who's Nothing got, to see here. Move right. on. Who's got three days to give up for, for Jesus? I, I'll come on Sundays, right? Uh, there's all these moments throughout your life that you could have just claimed the period. But instead, you decided to allow it to be a comma. And the miracle followed. Right. You, like you say, never put a, a period where God has a comma. Just remain, you know, like Jesus said, remain in me and I'll mm -hmm. remain in you. And it keeps growing. It keeps uh, evolving. It keeps growing into something different. He always has something new and different or enhancing for you. And even if it's just... Um, mentoring others, mm -hmm. sharing with others. I forgot one of the ironic things about uh, when I went on the walk to Emmaus, the guy that was my sponsor for that weekend was the same guy that I met first at Cornerstone that I thought I didn't really care for all that much. <laughs> he wound up, Mark Kessler, he wound up being my sponsor and uh, just eternally grateful for that. So John, when we were talking and we were uh, sharing our story and, and preparing for today, um, you, you told me a little bit about you, you were talking about the parable of the, of the lost son, uh, of the prodigal son, and how maybe that's not your story, but, but maybe there is a piece of that scripture that really is. I, I really like Luke 15, where you got those three parables mm -hmm. that Jesus is emphasizing how God goes looking for the lost. And you got the, the parable of the lost sheep. Mm -hmm. And that's a beautiful story. And there's a beautiful picture that I'm sure you've seen Jesus holding the lamb tenderly, and uh, it's just awesome to know that the lamb, Jesus goes and looks for the lamb. And you got the parable of the lost son, the son who turned his back on his father, and, and the father, you know, when the son comes back, the father goes out looking for him. And there's great artwork about the lost son, the prodigal son. And then there's also the story of the lost coin, I have never in my life seen a piece of artwork about the lost coin. And yet I think the lost coin kind of describes where I was. I was still in the house. The coin was still in the house, but it just wasn't where it could be used. It wasn't fulfilling its purpose that it was supposed to be there. And I think that's, you know, not everybody's going to have a prodigal son story. Not everybody's going to have a, you know, a lost sheep story. And so I'm really glad that God in his wisdom chose to have that lost coin in there. Still in the house, still around, but not usable as it was. I love that. Still in the house, but not ready to be used. Right. Amen. Amen. Let's welcome, or thank, not welcome. You, well, you don't, hey, don't, don't do it again. Let's do it again. <laughs> uh, let's thank John. <laughs> Thank you.
So church, as we wrap up this series, we wrap up June and we prepare for July to roll in and, and for Pastor Aaron to come and be with us next week, I just want to offer you a blessing. So we receive this blessing as an individual, but also as a church. Almighty God, you who called the universe into being, who formed our innermost being and called us your people, we give thanks for your constant presence. Through seasons of consistency and even in change, you are with us, calling us into deeper waters, calling us together in your spirit of unity, calling us out of ourselves into the world to serve others. We ask that you pour out a blessing on us as individuals and us as a church today. Allow us to find Jesus in our everyday story to see how our stories are deeper when we tell them together, to understand that you call our story sacred and holy because you are part of our story and we are part of your story, to know and trust that hope is poured into our stories through your church and to trust that you are still actively partnering with us to write our stories as part of your grand story. Church, know that you are loved by God. God, know that you are loved by this church. Amen? Amen. God bless you. Have an amazing week, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Amen.